Are you a beginner in reading the Bible and just want to know how do I study this thing? Well, if you are, then this video is for you. Okay, so first things first are kind of the basic things that you're going to need when it comes to Bible studying. Of course, the first thing is the actual Bible. Now, you definitely don't need to have a real hard copy of the Bible, although personally, I think that is better. If you're a digital person, by all means, you can have a digital Bible. So the two that I would recommend is the Holy Bible app and the Streetlights Bible app. Both of them are really good. The Streetlights one is a little bit more modern and kind of wraps the Bible to you in sections. And the Holy Bible app is fantastic because it has lots of plans and things that you can do alongside. Go on the Holy Bible app, go to plans, and you can have a look through and see what takes your fancy. And there's so many different things that you can study on there. So I highly recommend that. So first things first, why is it so important to study the Bible? And basically, it all comes down to knowing God. It's pretty much impossible to know God without knowing his word and everything that he has taught us, which is all in here. It does look like quite an intimidating book, but really, when you think about it, it's not that intimidating. It's 66 books. Some of them are like two to three pages long. Some of them is one page long letters. So don't let the size of the Bible intimidate you. It is such a wonderful, wonderful living book. And it's so important that as Christians, you get into it and you really read it and learn from it as well. That's why I love to study it because yes, you can read it and you kind of get a surface level of what the Bible is saying. But when you actually study the Bible, it can it is absolutely mind blowing how it all interlinks. Jesus runs the whole way through it. It's just an incredible book. It takes you on a full adventure. Okay, so first of all, I would like us to turn to Hebrews chapter four, verse 12. And I'm just going to read this out to you. So my version is NLT, the New Living Translation. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. And if I read the King James Version, that says, For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So when I'm reading the Bible, I'll just read my NLT. I find that one of the easiest translations to read. And for the most part, I really enjoy it. Although you do have to be careful because some verses are omitted from the Bible, but I'm aware of those and I've actually written them in my old NLT Bible. So that I've got them in there. But I do always like to cross-reference it with the King James Version, and I like to do that on the Bible app. That is what I'm looking at when I'm reading the King James Version. Another one that I'd like to go to is Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. And this is Jesus speaking and he said, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. And then of course we have a good old Psalm 119, which says that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God speaks to us through this. If you are praying about things, it's really important that you go to the word of God and very often you will get your answers from the word itself. So lots of good reasons of why we should study the Bible. So in an ideal world, I will get up before my whole family and I will spend time in the word. Now that my children are getting a little bit older, that doesn't happen so often. We tend to get up around about the same time, which is about 6.30 every morning. And then it's straight into breakfast and getting ready for school and things. So while my children are having their breakfast, I will squeeze in whatever I can Bible reading time. And that does vary. So if I manage to get up before them, I can spend a whole hour reading my Bible and doing a little bit of study or a devotional. But if they get up the same time as me, I'll probably only fit in a chapter. Sometimes not even that, but at least I have spent some time in the Word. And then when it comes to actual Bible study time, I tend to do that when I know that I've got time to actually sit down and spend time with God. So that tends to be more during the day if I get any time or on an evening when the children are in bed, which is rare because usually by that point, I'm exhausted. And then the last thing that I want to do is start trying to concentrate and study the Bible. So more often than not, that's when I can find some free time during the day. But I think it is really important to set up those habits because we become what we repeatedly do. And if you are consistently reading the word of God, you will see transformation happening in your life naturally because 
you're washing yourself in the word every single day. And all I mean by that is that God's word is going into your mind, which helps you to tackle any problems that come your way that day. And it really just helps you kind of keep your focus on him. And if you find that you struggle to pick up your Bible or you just forget about it as the day goes on, place it open somewhere that you will regularly walk past in your house just so that it will encourage you to be like, oh, actually, I've got some time. I'll sit and have a little read over this chapter or whatever. I think the main goal really of developing a Bible reading habit is to make it as simple and as easy as you possibly can for yourself. So I think when it comes to Bible study, one of the most important things that you can do is find a translation that works for you. Find one that you enjoy reading, it feels comfortable to read, and always have the Bible app there so that you can cross-reference it with different translations as well. Because when you read a Bible verse, if you want to study it and you read it in different translations, it can really stand out to you of what that Bible verse is actually saying, rather than just focusing on your translation. But I do think that it's really important to find one that works for you. So my favourite translations are the NLT and the NIV and the King James Version. But I know ESV is also very, very popular. So just have a look through all the different translations and find which one you like the best. I think people get very wrapped up in certain translations. This is what you should use. You shouldn't use this one. But at the end of the day, if you are reading God's word diligently and you are praying about it before you read it and asking the Holy Spirit to guide you, I think you're pretty good. Um, God will make you aware of anything that you need to be made aware of about translations and especially if you're cross-referencing you're going to get the gist of what that verse is saying. Okay so now let's get into the actual tips for how to study your Bible. Tip number one is to understand the context. But the Old Testament is focused on the Jewish faith while Christianity draws on the Old and the New Testaments and the New Testament basically fulfills the prophecies of the Old Testament. So the Old Testament has 39 books in it and I'm going to show you how all of these are kind of divided up into different categories and then the New Testament has 27 books in it and I'm going to split them up as well just to kind of give you a context of what all of these books are because you can chunk them together. Okay so you can split these up into five categories for each of the testaments. So the Old Testament starts with five books on the law which is Genesis through Deuteronomy. So those are the books on the law. And then next we have 12 books, which are the historical books, so the history. So that's from Joshua down to Esther. And then we have five books of poetry, which is Job down to Song of Songs. And then we have the major prophets, which is Isaiah to Daniel. And finally, we have the Minor Prophet, which is Hosea down to Malachi, the rest of the Old Testament. So I'm just going to write down the sides here. These are the law, history, poetry, major, prophets, prophets like that. And then for the New Testament, I'm sure you already know, we start off with the four Gospels. So that is Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And then a little history book on its own is the Acts of the Apostles. And then we have Letters to Churches, which is Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians and 1 and 2 Thessalonians. And then Paul also writes letters to friends, which are 1 and 2, Timothy, Titus, Philemon. And then we have general letters, which is from Hebrews down to Revelation. And the book of Revelation is also apocalyptic because it's talking about things that happen after this world ends. And you could also include Joel, Daniel and Zechariah in apocalyptic books as well. But this is the basic genres of the Bible. So I hope that helps. But basically, the Old Testament is everything from creation up to Jesus, and the New Testament is everything from Jesus onwards. So when you go to study a book of the Bible, it's really important that you understand its genre, 
who was it written to, who actually wrote it, what time period was it written in, what was going on around that time. And it's also great if you can get a little summary of the book before you start to read it. So I would always recommend a study Bible for this. They always provide a lovely chunky bit of context for you so that you know what you're going into with a little bit of knowledge. You're not just kind of jumping into a book of the Bible knowing nothing about it. So this one is my study Bible here. It's a very chunky Bible in comparison to my normal Bible but that is because it has so many extra notes so for example this is on the book of Ezekiel so Ezekiel is known for talking about the dry bones so it has a picture of dry bones here and then you can see here all of the extra context it has so it has the setting at the time it has a summary of the book of Ezekiel and it also tells me about the authorship and the date and it gives me some references where I can further go to find out more information as well. So I'd really recommend if you're going to seriously study your Bible, grab yourself a study Bible if you haven't got one already just because it gives you so many extra notes. This camera is about to die, so I think I'm gonna to have to switch over to my phone camera. So, so if the frame suddenly changes to something different, that is what's happened. But I'll just continue until it completely dies out. Tip number two is just to build up on that habit of reading your Bible as often as you can. Hopefully that will be every single day, but even if you can get it down to like three times a week, as long as you are spending some time in the Word of God and really studying what it has to say to you, building up on that habit so that it just becomes something that you do naturally. Number three is to get the right tools. So if you really want to study your Bible, like I say, grab yourself a study Bible. And another good thing that you can get is also a commentary, which is where Bible scholars write down their thoughts on, on each verse. I personally love to use Enduring Word. It is a free website commentary. And sorry, camera cut out. It is a free resource. I head over to Enduring Word and see what the Bible scholars have been saying about it. And then usually they will clarify a verse for me or bring something up that I would never have thought of in a million years and it just makes bible study so much more interesting because you're really learning from it and find something to really get your teeth into tip number four is not to compare yourself to others because we all know this if you have a social media account especially a christian one i myself have fallen under this trap where you look at other people's bibles on social media and you think oh, they must spend hours and hours doing this bible study their bibles look amazing they have so many notes they must be so knowledgeable in the word of god no none of that matters all that matters is that you are spending time in the word of God okay don't worry about Sheila down the road okay forget Sheila all that matters is that you are spending time in the word of God and that you are learning something from what you're reading doesn't have to look beautiful doesn't have to be perfect all that matters is that you personally are talking to God and hearing back from God through his word and tip number five speaking of writing in your bible is exactly that get into your bible get your pens get your highlighters do not be afraid to write in your Bible. I know it is a sacred and holy book, but God has given us this word so that we can grow more like Jesus, learn about God, learn more about him. And if you are taking notes on his word and highlighting things that you want to remember and putting post-it notes in to save a page, I don't see any problem with that. I think that is excellent studying. If you go to university, they tell you to annotate in your books, highlight anything that you think is important or relevant. And I feel the same way about the bible now if you have a real issue with that and you just you can't physically bring yourself to write in your bible i highly recommend that you do post-it notes you can mark up post-it notes no problem stick them in and then they will easily peel back off so you're not making any kind of permanent marks in your bible and someone commented on my last video that you can actually get see-through post-it notes which is a great idea because then you can see the text underneath them as well or you can get the interleaved bibles which actually have like in between the bible pages it actually has a spare piece of paper that's just blank so you can write on them so you're not writing on the holy scriptures you're writing on an extra piece of paper so there's lots of different ways that you can do it out there depending on how comfortable you feel personally i would just say get stuck in it's your bible i've got some bibles from years ago like this one which is literally fallen to pieces i mean this was my bible for a very long time but sometimes i just love to go through this and see all of the kind of notes that i took back then because i still learn things from the notes that i took 
back when I was in my early 20s. So it turns into like a really lovely personal resource between you and God. And it just makes it feel more inviting to me. So a blank one, like my new one right now, doesn't have as much appeal to be picked up and read as a one that's got lots of my notes in because I know that in that Bible, I can quickly find things and look back at the things that I've highlighted where this one is just kind of a very clean paged Bible at the moment. This will be transformed across the next year, but for now, it's just clean. If you found this interesting and you would like to actually spend some time studying the Bible now, I'm going to actually spend the next part of this video studying James chapter three. Pause this video, go and get your Bible, your pens, your highlighters, and then come back and we'll study James chapter three together. And I'll make sure that I upload James chapter one and two to my Instagram as well, so that you can see the kind of notes that I've taken for them as well. So I'm going to be using these three highlighters, which I just got off Amazon. I'll make sure to link them in the description below. I really like these because they don't bleed through the Bible. I don't have any particular colour coding system. All I do is I alternate the colours as I take my notes so that everything kind of looks cohesive. And I make sure that my notes match up to the highlighted section. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my study Bible and I'm just going to get some context on the book of James. So it tells us here that James was Jesus's brother and he became the recognised leader of the Jerusalem church shortly after Jesus's resurrection. So after Jesus was resurrected, the Christians started to set up churches and, and James became the leader of the church in Jerusalem, which is obviously a very important church. So this book is written to Jewish Christians who have been scattered by the persecution which began with the stoning of Stephen. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 8 verse 1, 11 and 19. I would recommend that you, if you don't know the story about Stephen being stoned, you go and read that. It's really, it's really quite an important Bible story. But from this, we've learned that this is written to Jewish Christians and that James was the brother of Jesus and that he was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. So that's some important contextual information right there. Then it's got a summary of the letter, which says that it is written from a pastor's perspective and focuses more on ethics than any other book of the New Testament. The letter contains teachings based on the law as understood through the life and teaching of Jesus. And then it also has this timeline here, which tells us about each chapter, kind of what you can find in each chapter. So we're doing chapter three, which is about speech and conflict. And if we look in my Bible, it's actually titled Controlling the Tongue. So we can already tell from here that, that this is going to teach us about how we speak. I've already seen James talk about this in verse 19 here, where he tells us that you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to get angry because when we are fast to speak words can come out that we wish we hadn't said and we can regret so now that we've got a little bit of context we're going to read through chapter three and then we'll go back over and take some notes so james tells us here that not many of you should become teachers in the church for we who teach will be judged more strictly so I think that Bible verse is really important because when you are teaching people about Christ, you can lead them down a total wrong path. So you have to be pretty sound in what it is that you are teaching them and make sure that you are leading them to Jesus. I've just highlighted that, but I don't think I'll take any notes on it because I think that's pretty self-explanatory. And it does say, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. So James understands that we will always have struggle with controlling our tongues. That is not something that comes easily to people and we would be perfect if we could do it. So nobody can. It's something that we've constantly got to work on. And then just looking at what the Bible commentary says here, it says Jesus demonstrated in Matthew 12 that words are the revelation of the inner character. So the words that we say kind of reveal how our heart is and how we think about things. To not stumble in word shows true spiritual maturity. This is especially relevant to teachers who have so much more opportunity to sin with their tongue. I really like how James explains this part about the horse. So a horse, if you put a small bit in its mouth or a small rudder can make a huge shape turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. If we have control over our tongue, it's an indication that we have control over ourselves. 
Whoever can control the tongue can bridle the whole body. And it says here, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupt in your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire for it's set on fire by hell itself. And in Turin words says here, children are told sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. But that child's rhyme isn't really true. The bitter pain of a word spoken against us can hurt us for a lifetime long after the broken bone has healed. Words can be like tiny sparks that set a whole forest on fire. So because I haven't taken any notes here, I like to kind of highlight whatever the chapter is talking about. So I'm going to write in quite big letters here, control your tongue, like that. And then I'm just gonna go over it with some color, just because I like it to pop out as I'm flicking through my Bible, just like that. And then I'll just highlight off those bits. And then I'm just going to underline where it says no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring but the tongue can be brought under the power of the control of the Holy Spirit. So I'm just going to put that here. So James is making it very clear that we need to be praying daily about our words and the things that we say and that we need to be slow to speak and quick to listen. And that is something that we need to practice every single day because none of us can tame our tongue. Okay, so going back to how it's talking about how our tongue can one minute bless God and the next minute curse someone. And Durham Word says here that our speech should be consistently glorifying to God. We shouldn't use one vocabulary or one tone of speaking at church and a different one at home or on the job. So I think that's something that we all need to repent from on the regular is praising God one minute and then going into work and gossiping about a colleague or slandering someone or even something as simple as complaining. It's really important that we just watch what it is that comes out of our mouth. Okay, so I've just looked through this section of James chapter three and I've just written up this little summary which says the tongue is a small thing that can do enormous damage. So I'm just going to stick that right here and then every time i come back to james i'll know straight away what this is about so this is a very very simple bible studying just using the notes from the bible commentary and from my study bible to take notes and highlight things that james is teaching us so this is what that little section looks like that we've just studied together. I hope that you got something out of that and that it was helpful. Just showing you kind of the different tools that you can use. Another thing that I would recommend that you do is you go off and read this in a few different translations and then pop notes in of what they say and what they teach you as well. And then just end this time of Bible study in prayer over controlling your tongue. So it's really important that we apply what we've read to our lives. So, so let's just say a prayer together now on controlling our tongues. And then you can go off and try and apply this to your life and consciously think about the words that you're saying for the rest of the day. Lord, I know my tongue often gets ahead of my mind and my heart. I am quick to speak and I repent of the many thoughtless things I've spoken. I'm sorry for words I've spoken in anger or in gossip. Please help me to see when I am about to speak without thinking and check my heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it and I will see you next time. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye. You watch me on